Well, we're continuing now in our study in the Epistle to the Hebrews. Um, and uh, we left off it late in uh, chapter nine. So we're going to pick up, do a, just a little bit of, uh, of an introduction here as we pick up in, in deep into chapter nine. The, this, uh, this verse, which we take from chapter seven about the law making nothing perfect. Uh, and more of that is going to become evident as we go through chapter, the end of chapter nine and into chapter 10, the bringing in of a better hope, this better hope, this is the new, which is the, the law written in their mind and in their hearts. Uh, and then that is which uh, and it will enable them to draw nigh unto God. And, and when we say them, when it says we, which by which we draw nigh, we're talking about circumcised Hebrew kingdom gospel believers. It's a mouthful, but that's the audience to whom the uh, writer to the Hebrews, this is not about the body of Christ. It's about the circumcised Hebrews, or we otherwise call them Jews, but they believe the kingdom gospel, the kingdom gospel being the good news that Jesus is the Christ and that he came once and that he's coming back. So in, in chapter 10, verse 39, the verse is, but we, again, it's these circumcised Hebrew kingdom believers, but we are not of them that draw back into perdition not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So who are these that drew back into perdition? So in view, all through this uh, letter to the uh, Hebrews, is what happened to Israel in the wilderness. And there was a time as they, were, they had left Egypt and they were on to the promised land. They believed God long enough to leave Egypt, but when they got into the wilderness, they began to draw back. They, they, stopped, they stopped believing. And the things that they said after they heard the report from the spies was that would God that we had died in the land of Egypt or would God we had died in this wilderness. So God said, all right, if that's what you would prefer, then you will die in the wilderness. And so a whole generation of, of Hebrews died. <laughs> the language is uh, fairly coarse. Their carcasses fell in the wilderness. They weren't able to go on. So this is the point that's being made here in Hebrews 10.39. We are not of them who draw back. This is not something that concerns the body of Christ. It concerns the Hebrews who have to keep mo moving forward. Okay, so we're in chapter 9. We're going to pick up at verse 26, uh, and Vivian will read these, and then we'll, we'll, we'll look at these final verses in, in uh, chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 26 through 28. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation." So let's take a detailed look. Verse 26, uh, the first part of it, for then must he, that would be Jesus, often have suffered since the foundation of the world. So he doesn't have to su suffer often. He has suffered, but now once in the end of the world, and that's talking now about the end of the system, the world system. He's actually put a judicial end to the world system. So once in the end of the world, he hath, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So this is now complete assurance. What the writer to the Hebrews is telling them is that Jesus has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now we compare this to what the writer had just said 
just a few verses earlier in chapter 9, verse 22. Uh, Hebrews 9, 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So we just compare what is said in verse 26 with what was said in verse 22, that the law really couldn't put away everything. There was still that, and, and this is what affected the conscience. So there was not there was not an assurance of all things, of all things being purged. So thus the, the conscience was a problem for those that were being, uh, having sin re remitted by the law. Excuse me, Van? Yes. Can I just make a comment that yeah, is just kind of jumping out at me? And I didn't really realize this, but you know where he says, put away sin by the sacrifice of himself? Yes. It reminds me of, of Daniel chapter 9, where it says um, that he's going to put an end to sin. Yes. yes. And yes. how That's right. you know, as believers, we're always trying to figure out Daniel chapter 9, and maybe... Yeah. That's what it means. <laughs> yeah, it, it, he puts an end. Now, it, now, this end at this point is judicial. And when I say that word judicial, that is he has the authority to do it, mm -hmm. but it has not yet been enacted. Then, yeah. Okay, so then we have here in verse 27, this matter of this appointed and it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Now again, speaking to Hebrews, and the Hebrews are going to be judged. So this appointment is uh, by the Oxford English Dictionary, that word appointment means that it's fixed by authority. In other words, it's ordered. So there's an order to, for men to once die. And this, is, this word is used in the Coverdale Bible, and we see it here in the 1611 King James Bible. It's appointed unto men once to die. After this, the judgment. So the appointment, this appointed death is the result of sin. So I'm going to ask the question, do we all have to die? Do all men have to die? And then my response is, at this point, this is uh, my response is no. He shall appear to some who remain alive. Now, as we go into verse 28, we'll see this. So, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Now, notice this. In that he died, he died unto sin once. So he was once offered and then to bear the sins of many. So why only to bear the sins of many? I, I thought, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So why is it just the sins of many? Well, it's the many that look for him. Again, this is a Hebrew audience. It's the many that look for him. And we see this here in verse 28, the second part of the verse. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, so these, the, the them of the Hebrews, that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So this appearing concerns the earthly kingdom. So there, the Hebrews are, look, there are these, there, not all of them, but there are those that are looking for him, Christ, Jesus, the one that they believe to be their Messiah, to appear the second time. So the audience here is believing Hebrew. So not to confuse myself in this mix. Well, but we, so, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll differentiate the body of Christ from what is being said to these Hebrews. Can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead, Liz. Okay, sorry, I don't want to keep interrupting, but um, it says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, I see that talking about Jesus being appointed to, to die once, that there's no more sacrifice being done over and over again, because if it's not Jesus, there's two deaths for men, there's the first physical death, and then there's the second death, 
at the white throne judgment. So would this not be pointing to Jesus in verse? Well, I th- um, yeah, I think you make a really good point. Uh, he took death for us. Actually, we're born spiritually dead. So it's not that we're born and then we die spiritually. We're, we're actually born sp- spiritually dead. And it's not until one believes God, then they're created a new creation, a new creature in Christ Jesus. So, but it's this flesh, this flesh does have to die. And I see it as you're saying that, yes, this does point to Christ, appointed unto men, and he took that appointment. Now, the question still is, what about the rest of us? Do we all have to die? So, to whom did he appear the first time? And then we'll have, we'll have, so we'll, we'll look at this here about the Hebrews, unto them that look the first, uh, unto him, unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time. We're going to look at John chapter 16. There's a few verses we have to read. John 16, verse 16, the first part, part A. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And part B, uh, sorry, that's 19. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and, and again, and, yeah. a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. And in verse 19, now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, a little while, and ye shall not see me, and again, a little while, and ye shall see me. Verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrows shall be turned into joy. And verse 22. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy shall no man take taketh from you so we're thinking about this verse 28 in chapter 9 so christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation so this is what jesus is saying here in his words in in the gospel of john He talks about, I see you, I'm not going to see you for a while, and then I'm going to see you, I will see you again. So this is prophecy. And and we're going to make a distinction here between prophecy and mystery. Um, So what we're looking at here are matters of prophecy, and prophetically, the second coming of Jesus is going to bring to the earth some notable conditions that there are things that are going to happen on earth that will precede the second coming of Jesus. So let's look at this. Luke 21 verses 25 and 26. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and looking for after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now notice, the, the, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. I note from Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, that the prince, there is a prince of the power of the air. That Those powers of the air uh, are not just atmospheric conditions this is speaking of the prince of the power of the air the powers of the heaven shall be shaken okay continuing on in luke 21 luke 21 verses 27 and 28 and then shall i see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory and when these things begin to come to pass then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So this is prophetic. This is not mystery. These are things that can be read by all of us concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
and he's coming for those whom, for whom he appeared the first time. Now, Zechariah 13, 9. Zechariah 13, 9. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. Okay, so this is Ze the prophet Zechariah who's writing to the people of God which uh, which are the Hebrews? It's uh, I I know that that today uh, Protestant theology likes to replace Christians with the with the Hebrews, but I uh, am quite convinced that I am not going to be going through a fire to be refined as gold is refined. Um, and when the people call on him, he's going, they're going to be calling on him for salvation because they're threatened now with total uh, death. All of the Hebrews are now cornered to the point that they cannot defend themselves. They're going to, they actually now are going to call on God. In the tribulation. In, this is during the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble when they are purified. So a third are going to be brought through the fire, two-thirds are going to die. Now, Zechariah chapter 14. This Ze is now this follows Zechariah 13, Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 4. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Okay, so this is what's going to happen at the second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's coming. Now, it's Zechariah, who's writing this. In chapter 13, we saw that it would it would be the hebrews now brought through the fire who would actually call and when they call on god up till now they're they're not calling on him but there's a, a day is going to come when they are going to be compelled to call on god for salvation and god's going to hear them and he'll come and when he comes he's going to come to the mount of olives and at the mount of olives which is before jerusalem that mount is going to cleave. This, is, this concerns the second coming. We're going to compare this in a moment to, the, to that matter which we call the rapture. All right, so ver, chapter 9, verse 28, uh, concludes with this promise of the second advent of Christ. So we're now, we're finishing up with chapter 9, and the concluding thought is that for these Hebrews, those of the Hebrews that look for him, in other words, they're going to be alive, they look for him, shall he appear the second time. So these Hebrews will be able to avoid the appointment with death. That's the point, because in verse 27, it says, it's appointed unto man once to die. These will be these Hebrews that look for him to appear the second time will avoid that appointment when Christ comes for them. But now you say, well, what is promised to the body of Christ? Because what we've just looked at is that which is promised to the Hebrews. Is there a promise to the body of Christ? Will some also miss the appointment with death? Will there really be a rapture of the body of Christ? There, are, this is this has been a a doctrine that has been continually under criticism and attack. Or is there only a promised second advent? So, so Brother yes. Van, yeah, yeah, Phil. Before we go into all these fantastic questions, can I just make a comment uh, uh, of the upper part of that slide? Yeah. 
I mean, to me, that's an aha moment, you know, yes, that uh, when he appears the second time, I mean, he's he's come to stay. And those that are alive with them, yeah, he brought that out. I've never thought of it that way, that they're not going to die because he's going to set up the kingdom, finish the battle, clean things up, you know, sheep and goats, judgment of nations. Uh, the other thing, too, I guess, is that um, there have been, where's the little flock at this time? There have been a lot of people killed yeah. uh, that, ha that have believed and died yeah. before this appearance. So some have died. Yes, and will not die. So that that's this is um, that's great to bring it out. Appreciate. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Me too. Yeah. Okay. So that and that's the point. Now, so we're we're going to rightly divide. We're going to now we're going to we're going to separate the things that are being said to the Hebrews because they have promises. There are promises that are made to Israel, and they're encouraged to believe and to not draw back but to continue believing there are also promises made to the body of Christ, which is that which exists now on earth during the dispensation of the grace of, of God. It won't be on earth when all that takes place. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. And, and it, it, the body of Christ and the body of Christ is removed. So will grace as a dispensation be removed. Okay. So now what we've been talking about to this point, is prophecy. Now, prophecy differs from mystery. And this was the first, first thing that I ever heard. It was brought to us by Brother Phil. And he, years ago, gave us a message about the, the greatest division in Scripture is not Old Testament, New Testament. It's mystery and prophecy. And, and Phil got us going with that many years ago 10 years ago is it at up least to 10 years is it it's 10, coming 10 up years yes yeah. so so now prophecy is that which can be searched in the scriptures anything that is prophetic is a matter that is searchable in the scriptures in fact jesus said to uh the hebrews he says you search the scriptures because in them you think you can find salvation so they, they were instructed to search the scriptures. Mystery is that which is unsearchable. Now, in a moment, you're going to see that this matter of mystery and something being unsearchable, and when I say unsearchable, really what we're saying is it, you can't find it. I mean, you can look for it, but it's not there. So consequently, it's this, the King James Bible says it is an unsearchable matter it is nowhere to be found in scripture but folks don't um, most of christendom do not agree with this even though the words are what they are they have and we're going to see they have a different way they pour a different understanding into this matter of mystery and something being unsearchable what we're going to be talking about now for a few minutes in order to see the difference between prophecy and mystery is the household of God. And the household of God, this is from Ephesians chapter 2, the household of God, there is, there is a partition, but we are fitly framed together. Prophecy and mystery do come together in the household of God. The foundation of the household of God is Jesus Christ. And the doctrines are built upon the apostles and prophets. So everything that we know came from Jesus Christ through to the apostles and prophets. And then Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. So he's the cap as well as the foundation where the whole household of God fits between Jesus, the, the chief corner and the foundation. Now, of this matter of the household of God, mystery the apostle is Paul. For its prophecy, the, uh, the apostle is Peter. Paul preached the gospel of grace. Peter preached the kingdom gospel. They are two different gospels. Paul preached the gospel of grace to the uncircumcised. 
That's Ephesians chapter 2. Peter. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Peter preached to the circumcised. Paul preached to those Hebrews. They were uncircumcised, but Paul called them to be saints. Whereas Peter preached to the circumcised, and when they believed, they became saints. Also in this group, under uh, uh, over under Paul, over is the part are the partakers of the benefit. Partakers of the benefit, First Timothy chapter six verse two. That's where I am. I'm a partaker of the benefit. I am not a call to be saint in that I don't have a vocation. I'm not gifted. I'm not a member in particular. Uh, I don't have the qualifications. Uh, or the gifts to be a saint. I am a Gentile of the nations, but having believed, I am now a partaker of the benefit of the gospel of grace. I'm saved. Here with uh, Peter's group, they, they preach to the circumcised saints, and they also, in this group, they preach to proselytes. Now, the proselytes were those Hebrews that had not been circumcised, and they could convert to uh, becoming a Jew by circumcision. So the, uh, the gospel, the kingdom gospel, was preached to those that were saints and proselytes. To Judaism. To Judaism, yeah. So this group on the left, the apostle Paul, this whole group is the new creature. The group on the right, all together, they're under the new covenant. Now, the new covenant, which we're studying here in Hebrews, is the, is the, uh, the New Testament in my blood, Jesus said. It is the law which is going to be written in their mind, and in their hearts. That's the new covenant. The old covenant was them working the law with the sacrifices and a system that could never make them perfect. So the new covenant is what they're moving towards. We, on the, on the left here, are a new creature when we're in Christ, we become a new creature, Ephesians 4, 24, where we're created in righteousness and true holiness. That is the new creature. Now, the new creature, mystery, is looking for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The high calling of God is Philippians 3, 14. We're, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be getting to that in just a moment. But this is, this is the the map of where we're going. On the right, the Apostle Peter, those under the new covenant, there's the first coming, and now they're looking for the second coming. So they're looking for the second coming, whereas the new creature is looking for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The second coming is a matter of prophecy. The high calling of God is a mystery. It's not found in Scripture. The well, new what creature, exactly is the high calling of God? Can you just give us a, a sentence that we can write down? I'll give you, you one word. One We're, word. Going We're going to it, but it is okay. the rapture. It's the rapture. We call oh. it the rapture. But it's coming up. Yeah, it's coming in just a moment. So, but this this is the proper reference to it. It is, we also call it the catching up, but the proper reference to it is Philippians 3.14, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to give you more detail on this in a moment. Now, after the high calling of God, our citizenship, which is in heaven, is where we're going to be uh, kept. That's our part of the house. We're in the heavenly places. Whereas the, uh, 
the, the kingdom saints under the new covenant with the new covenant written in their mind and in their hearts, they are on earth. So there's a kingdom coming to earth. We know that from Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, thy, the, kingdom thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's going to be fulfilled for them. And what is a mystery is those things which are going to be fulfilled for the body of Christ. So this, this is the this is the, the, the map of what is true for the household of God. The, prophetically, it's the second coming. Mystery, it's the high calling of God. So you can see from my little diagram that the high calling of God is not the second coming. It's going to precede. It's going to precede the second coming. All right. So I'm just going to leave this here for a second, and then we'll move on. Yes. The house is fitly framed together. The house is fitly framed together, and and we've got we have believing Hebrews, believing Israel on the right side. We have the body over which Christ is head on the left side, and together we are fitly framed together. All right. So now. Let's look at this matter of the rapture of the church, which is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, before we actually get to the verses concerning the rapture of the church, I, I do want to ask the question, should we consider the rapture of the church sound doctrine or not sound doctrine? Realizing that those of us that that understand and believe that there's going to be a rapture of the church are a tiny minority of all of Christendom. So none of the Orthodox believe there's a rapture. The Catholic don't believe a rapture. The uh, Reformed Christians do not believe a rapture. The, uh, oh. Many denominations. Many, uh. the, the, there is just a small segment of all believers, tiny, which believe that there is a rapture. What they have concluded is that the second coming is the only hope for, the, for all of us and that we're all looking forward to the second coming. So concerning the, the body of Christ, this is mystery. And mystery, now we've said, is that which cannot be found in Scripture apart from what Paul has said. Now, we're going to look at a verse here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. And, and the words here are important, and I'll show you what's happened to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're reading verse 7 and the first part of verse 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. Okay, so... We've said that mystery is that which is unsearchable, and Paul even says it's wisdom. The translators tell us it's hidden wisdom. It's hidden in God, and, and the King James translators thought it, uh, understood it wise to help us understand that this wisdom of God is actually hidden. So it's a mystery, and this word mystery, when it's used, is always the same word and it's mystery, it's different from the word we use today. When we say mystery, we're talking about something that's difficult to figure out. We use mystery like a whodunit, uh, like a uh, trying to figure out who's responsible. So that would be a mystery. But when scripture uses the word mystery, mystery is something which is unstated, it's unsearchable, it cannot be found. And then Paul says, none of the princes of this world knew. So the princes of this world would chiefly include the devil. We'll say, well, how do you know that? Well, Jesus himself referred to the prince of this world in John 12, 31, in John 14, 30, and in John 16, 11. He spoke of the devil as being the prince of this world. 
You say, well, Van, that was before the cross. Certainly after the cross, the devil was disposed uh, or deposed. <laughs> he was deposed. And now God is ruling and he is the God of this world. And we don't have to worry about the devil anymore. Well, no. Um, Paul refers to the devil in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So this is well after the crucifixion. And Paul still refers to the devil as the God of this world. That's 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So difficult for us to accept, but the truth is bad things happen in this world because the devil is the God of this world. Still. Still. <laughs> and this, this actually completely is the, the reformed Christians are, are militantly against this kind of teaching. If you tell somebody uh, or share with somebody who goes to a church um, that is an Orthodox Christian church, uh, a reformed church, and you try and share with them your knowledge that the devil is the God of this world, they'll be gobsmacked. They'll think you're nuts. Well, Paul tells us this, and that's the only way we know it not because we make it up. Now, is it possible to learn sound doctrine from versions of the Bible, realizing that we don't use a version of the Bible, we use the King James Bible. There are, the King James Bible follows the Bishop's Bible, and the Bishop's Bible was translated, uh, or was, was refined by 54 translators at the time of 1611, to get rid of the notes, to standardize spelling and punctuation. So we went from the Bishop's Bible to the King James Bible. But there are yet, there are versions of the Bible which come from other manuscripts. And so consequently, there are other versions of the Bible. So we say, no, it is not possible to learn sound doctrine from uh, God's words from ver versions of the Bible are corrupt. And when we say versions of the Bible, we mean the Revised Standard Version, the NIV, the, uh, the um, NASB. NASB, New American ESB. Standard. Uh, all these versions are actually corrupt. And I'll demonstrate. So here we have 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, the King James wording which, and I'll read this, which none of the princes of this world knew, colon. Now let's compare that to the NIV. The NIV translates, and it renders 1 Corinthians 2 a, none of the rulers of this age understood it, and they leave a comma. So they get rid of the colon. The colon tells me that the words coming are the explanation. The comma that the NIV uses is that this is just an additional thought. So they say, the NIV says, the rulers of this age didn't understand the hidden wisdom, the, hidden wisdom. the mystery. They didn't understand, the, but, but the King James is telling us that, they, that, they, that the princes of this world didn't know something. That's a significant difference. The difference between knowing something and understanding it. Okay, I move forward. So NIV, NASB, English Standard Version, Revised Standard, none of these Bibles are going to help me to understand sound doctrine. I need to stick with the King James Bible. Now, Let's look at the princes of this world. So we know that the princes of this world chiefly include the devil. We know that from what Paul tells us. It's the God of this world. The God of this world. So now this is the devil. Now look at the authority that the devil as the God of this world has. He still has this authority. Okay. Um, right. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 to 7. And uh, this is the subject of Jesus being taken. The, and the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, 
and the glory of them, for that it is delivered unto me, and to whosoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Notice the devil said, I can give you the glory of all these kingdoms. He's saying this to Jesus Christ, and he explains, he actually tells us the reason why he can do it. He says, all the kingdoms have been delivered unto him. Now, how did this happen? Well, Adam was to be the king of the earth. He was to have dominion, and he was to subdue the earth. But when he followed the, the devil, the serpent, he turned over his authority to the serpent, to the devil. And so the, the devil can rightly say, the kingdoms are delivered unto him, and he can give them to whoever he wills. This is his authority. He still has his authority. Then John 14.30. John 14.30. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. So this is Jesus referring to the prince of this world, who is the devil, but the devil had not been able to find anything in Christ that he could accuse Jesus of failing. There was these, so Jesus says, he has nothing in me. He's found nothing that he can actually fault me. But Jesus refers to him, Jesus himself refers to him as the prince of this world. Now, Luke 22. Luke 22, verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. So what we're going to point out here is that Satan is actually responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. We see here in Luke 22, 3, that Satan enters into Judas, surnamed Iscariot. Now, let me just quickly add here, Satan cannot enter any one of us today as a believer. A believer of the body of Christ is sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and because the believer is sealed and the, and the believer is marked as belonging to Christ, Satan cannot enter the believer. Absolutely cannot happen. Nothing to be concerned about. We move on to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So we see that Satan entered into Judas and he put into Judas' heart the whole matter of betraying Jesus so that Jesus would end up being crucified. So we're thinking about now 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 and 8. We speak of the wisdom of God in a mystery, so that which is unsearchable which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So what we're looking at here is that Satan is moving to crucify Christ, and he's doing it not realizing that there is a matter he doesn't know anything about, and he's going uh, to take action against Jesus, and but if he had known the mystery, he wouldn't have done this. So he doesn't know the bigger picture, right? So right. Th that being that God is going to create this one new man between Jew and Gentile and that no longer um, will we need to go through Israel to be saved. Is that exactly uh, exactly. He had no idea that that God had a plan to bring salvation to the world by grace through the death of Christ. And I also don't think he knew that we would be hidden Christ, that it would be Christ in us, you know, the hope of glory, right? Because before it was very external. Exactly. Now it's, exactly, okay. Liz. And it had to be done by works. Uh, yeah, and they had to be, we had to be, under the law, you have to be faithful with that. So everything that Paul says, the devil didn't know. So we're talking about the mystery and the mystery is hidden wisdom. And then we're gonna, now we're going to consider this matter of it being unsearchable. 
So Paul writes mystery of which the devil had no knowledge. And we say Paul writes mystery. These things that Paul has written, when we read Paul's words, the Satan, when, the, when the devil saw these words, it was kind of like, wow, I didn't know this. So why didn't the devil know the mystery? Why couldn't he, why couldn't he know it? Why couldn't he figure it out? <laughs> because, because that knowledge, the doctrine of the mystery was unsearchable. It is nowhere to be found in scriptures. That is the prophetic scriptures. It's nowhere to be found. Now, Christendom in all flavors has missed this point. So those that are dispensational who actually see the promises to Israel as being different to the promises to the body of Christ are the only ones in Christendom who know that there are things that are unsearchable. That doesn't mean we're the only ones saved. We're not the only ones <laughs> saved, by the way. That, that's, this is a matter of doctrine. We're talking about knowledge and doctrine. We're not saved by doctrine. So then Ephesians 3, 8. Unto me, go ahead, oh, Vivian. Yeah, read. you read that one. Ephesians 3, 8. Unto me, who am a less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So what Paul is preaching, Paul says that he, he doesn't say we, he says, I should preach among the Gentiles, that is the uncircumcised, the unsearchable riches of Christ. So that's everything that is not in scripture that has now been revealed to Paul and go back to the household of, of uh, God uh, diagram that I showed, that Paul received all this uh, enlightenment. So this revelation was given to him. He alone received the unsearchable riches of Christ, of Christ, and that's what he preached. So is it possible to learn sound doctrine from versions of the Bible? No. God's word and the versions are corrupt. Let me demonstrate. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8b, in the King James, I should have that a B, the King James Bible, we read that I, that's Paul, should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now let's compare this to the rendering in the NIV which comes from the West Cotton Hort manuscript. The NIV, New International Version, reads for Ephesians 3, 8b, given to me, Paul, colon, to preach, the gen to, preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. So you see the difference. The King James Bible says the unsearchable riches of Christ. We know that the unsearchable is that they are nowhere in Scripture. They haven't been written down. When the NIV says the boundless riches of Christ. Well, the word boundless is a completely different word and definition to the word unsearchable. So you see, when I read the NIV, I'm going to get a very distorted understanding of sound doctrine. Here, it's boundless riches of Christ, but Paul wrote, really, that it is unsearchable. That is, what was given to Paul cannot be known un unless one reads what Paul has written. So, the NIV, the NASB, the English Standard Version, Revised, all those, uh, all these new versions, cannot learn sound doctrine from them. Not possible. All right. So let's look now at... Can one. I just make a comment? Oh. Yes, Karen. And when I think of all those different versions, you know, it, it all comes back to money. And when you see how the, the publishers will... I'm sure they for free, they, they, they'll give them to a church. Like I remember once going to a Willingdon church for some, uh, don't ask me why I was there. Some special thing was anyway, they were giving out free 
um uh, the the <laughs> that that new english one or something yes and i i know that they they will give them to churches and niv or different things and you know once they're handed out in the church and that's what's up on the uh the audio visual you know treatment on the wall and everything and you know like yeah. people exactly. just fall in fall in line yeah and you but study, you it's basically it. about money yeah and and the the the, the language of the re, of these new versions is uh is a deteriorated english from the english that's in the king james and the the, the path of scholarship has been to dumb down the scriptures including dumbing down the punctuation uh there isn't uh, the use of colons and semicolons uh in the uh, new in the perversions as there are in the uh in the king james bible because they they rationalize that well people today they speak more simply so we need to write a bible which is more simply stated well what happens is it's at the price of sound doctrine so now let's look at we're going to now look at the mystery now that we know from scriptures that paul wrote of things that are unsearchable they are mystery they are hidden wisdom let's take a look again at what paul said realizing that paul is the first to say these things we're going to be reading uh ephesians chapter 3 starting with verse 1 and then moving to verses 3 through 5. ephesians 3 1 for this cause i paul the prisoner of jesus christ for you gentiles verse 3 how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote before in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So Paul makes the point in verse 5, he says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, Paul says, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So there comes a point in time, Paul is saved, and now the revelation is given to him, and he is the one to make these things known. So what if the devil had known the mystery? Well, and according to 1 Corinthians 2, 8, if he had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So that, that would be the consequences of the devil knowing the mystery, but he didn't know it. So he ended up going his direction to try and rid the world of Christ. Now, if a mystery is a, just a misunderstanding, the consequences, if it's just a misunderstanding. Like the NIV. Like the NIV. Pre so, so, so all the other Bibles want us to think that what we're dealing with here is that it's not hidden. It's actually just a misunderstanding. Well, if it was just a misunderstanding, what if this were true? If it were true, if it's just a misunderstanding, then note this, then there is only one gospel. There's only one gospel. Peter and Paul preach the same gospel, but to different audiences. Now, this is the majority of, of uh, Christian teaching. The, 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 all of Christendom really see there's only one gospel, and that both Peter and Paul preached one gospel, but they just went to different audiences. That Paul went to the uncircumcised and Peter went to the circumcised. And so if you're having a conversation with somebody that doesn't, doesn't see the, the mystery, they're gonna say, no, no, there's only one gospel. There's only one gospel. And, and no matter what you try and say to them, they're not going to be able to see it otherwise because their Bible isn't going to help them to see it. 
Galatians, you want to... You go ahead. Galatians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 7, the last part of it, 7b. The gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So, <clears throat> when we read here in Galatians 2, 7, that the gospel of the circumcision, I just point out that the, the words of the gospel of the circumcision this word of is a preposition that indicates relationship so the gospel that is related to the circumcision that was committed to paul then there is a gospel that is related to the circumcision that's another gospel that gospel is uh, given to peter so here we see there are there are two gospels one related to the circumcision and one related to the uncircumcision and they each had an apostle to those gospels now the the other versions of the bible render galatians 7 differently so that this matter of the uh, the, the two gospels is obscured can't see it and so the majority of Christendom to this day think that there's only one gospel. Moving on. Now we're going to look at the mystery and Vivian will read about the mystery. First Corinthians 15, starting at verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Okay, now, so we're looking at this mystery, and we're, we're considering the matter, do all have to die? So we looked at the matter for the Hebrews, and we found that when the Hebrews call on God, he will come to save them and take them into the kingdom. Now we're looking at the mystery. So this is hidden wisdom where Paul says, we, the body of Christ, shall not all sleep. That is that we're not going to all die, but we shall all be changed. And then he talks about these matters here. The last trump, the dead will be raised and we shall be changed. And we talk about the mortal. So the mortal are those of us that are alive shall put on immortality at the rapture. Now, let's look at what Paul said to the Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 13 and move to verse 15. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Verses 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Period. End of thought. So there's nothing here about the Lord coming down and his foot touching the Mount of Olives and it cleaving. No, this is about something where we're going to be meeting him in the air. Now, this is mystery. Paul started off by saying, I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. Now, these brethren were Hebrews, and they knew the scriptures. Why would Paul say that I would not have you to be ignorant brethren? Because as much as these Hebrews knew the scriptures, there was nothing in the scriptures that would tell them about their being caught up to be with the Lord in the air. Nothing. So Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed about this. And he's filling them in. He's filling in the Thessalonians on this mystery. And now he's talking about them being ignorant. He's, he's getting rid of that ignorance. 
and he's telling them exactly what's going to happen. Because they're um, Hebrews, which belong to mystery, not prophecy. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are different. Uncircumcised. Now, so, and then Paul says, wherefore, this is to be a comfort one another with these words, period, end of thought. Now, let's look at Philippians 3.14. Philippians 3.14, I, that is Paul, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul says, I press toward the mark. So he's moving toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, cry, prize is a reward. It's a symbol of victory. So Paul says, if I do this thing willingly, I, Paul, have a reward. Paul knew that he had a reward coming to him for those things that he did as an apostle. So the prize is to value or, to some, or something that is highly esteemed or to esteem highly. So he says he's pressing towards that prize. And then he says, of... So that means related to, this is a prepositional adverb, it's expressing the relationship. So the prize is related to the high. Now, so you say, well, what's that word high? Well, there's two senses to the word high. One is literal and one is figurative. So I'll just give you a clue. When I read the King James Bible, unless there's a reason to understand it figuratively, I take it literally. So the literal sense is of great or considerable upward extent, extending far upward, rising considerably from a surface, situated far above the ground. So that word high indicates something that is upward and rising above the ground. Paul calls it a high calling. Now, the figurative sense would be of exalted rank, station, position. Well, Paul is, or has already been called to be an apostle, so he's not looking forward to being uh, given a rank or a station. So the figurative sense doesn't make doesn't work here. It's the literal sense. So the high calling is something that is moving upward. Calling, the action of the verb, call, that is to shout, notice. And remember this word, shout, to utter loudly, a summon, to utter one's voice loudly, forcibly, distinctly, so as to be heard at a distance the high calling so it's it's construed with the words to or after a person that i'm trying to get their attention so vivian will call me when she wants my attention so this is the high calling of god. the high calling of god in christ jesus now compare this for a moment again with first thessalonians 4:16 where we read, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Well, that shout is the calling, Philippians 3.14. It's the same thing. What's going on here is there's a time when the Lord himself will descend in the clouds, and he's going to shout to get our attention to call us upward. And that is that's the matter that's placed before us in Philippians 3.14, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is the catching up, and it, it, which we've referred to commonly as the rapture. And then we have a period, which means end of thought. It's interesting, too, you know, because the prior verse says to me, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. So this is obviously something that he has not obtained yet, right? Yes, exactly. So he's still, he's looking forward to obtaining. And he's, a, he, he'd otherwise, he had obtained the work, the commission. 
he had the relationship, he had the doctrine, so there was something yet that he was he's looking forward to, and that looking forward to is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So then we ask the question, is the rapture, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, is the catching away, is it sound doctrine or not sound doctrine? Well, I don't confuse it now with the second advent or the second coming. We can see that it's clearly separate from the second coming. It is a separate coming of Jesus Christ for his body, and we do mark it then as sound doctrine. Okay, we have used up all our time, so we will not step into Hebrews chapter 10 at this point. We'll save that for our next study. We'll be moving into, uh, into Hebrews chapter 10 next time, where we'll be looking at these words in uh, Hebrews 10. 23, where the Hebrews are told to hold fast without wavering. These are not words for the body of Christ. These are words for the Hebrews who are to keep moving forward to their promises. Okay, so we'll end the study. We'll end the recording there.